Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I'm excited to delve into some earlier Quo channelings. In particular, we can see the very birth of Quo happen during the raw channelings. If a lot of this doesn't make sense, I've talked about this on many episodes, but to give you a better explanation, the raw material or the law of one channelings originated in 1981 through 1983. Three parties were involved, Carla Ruckert, Jim McCarty, and Don Elkins. One was a scribe, one asked questions, and one was an unconscious channel. And some incredible and profound insights came from this channeling. And some crazy things happened to Jim, Carla, and Don along this process. Entities attacked them, and ultimately Don Elkins, did not live after 1983. A lot of crazy stuff happened. And Ra had chosen to stop channeling directly through Carla because she would completely go unconscious. She would lose a lot of weight, give up a lot of energy. It was very, very difficult for her. So Quo was created because Ra is in the sixth density. Latwi is in the fifth density and Hatan is in the fourth density. And so Ra could communicate through Hatan and Latwi as Quo, and it would be safer for them. They could actually channel this information consciously. But this would not have happened without these earlier channelings where Hatan and Latwi would work together to channel with Carla and Jim and everyone else that was involved. And so we can see the beginnings and the patterns that formed in these channelings. I love these channelings and cannot wait to read them to you. We begin with a channeling delivered on October 3rd, 1982. So this is happening in the middle of the Law of One channelings. I am Hatan. I am now with this instrument. We greet you with the love and the light of the one infinite creator. If you need an example of something that is at peace with its environment, think of a cloud floating along on gentle breezes, blown by every wind, rained on, made fresh again, gets where it's going, at peace with its environment. When you seem to be scurrying and at odds with the things around you, think of yourself as a floating cloud. This will help you see that there is meant to be harmony in all things. Try to feel in your harmony, in harmony with your God. Problems will not seem as acute, more as an ongoing thing, as weeds in a flower garden, as rain in the sky. Get the feeling of oneness. This will help you. People and animals around you, feel your serenity. It will not solve your problems, but it will give you a harmony with them. I am Hatan. I leave this instrument, Carla Channeling. I am Hatan and greet you once again through this instrument in the love and the light of the infinite creator. It is our joy to speak through each instrument and we respect the always courteous portion of the one known as A and the one known as M2 as they each wish to allow others the opportunity to exercise their channel. At the risk of sounding repetitious, we would point out to each the ultimate difficulty of such an overwhelming courtesy. However, we are inclined to allow these developing channels the opportunity to feel with more and more certainty when we wish to speak through one or the other. It is very seldom that we shift our communication to more than one instrument at a time, and when the parallel activation is done, it is for the purpose of confirmation. Therefore, we will leave this instrument for a time and once again offer to one but not both of these instruments an opportunity which may be taken at this time to speak a few words. We will then gladly confirm through this instrument the intention which we had. I am Hatan. M2 channeling. I am Hatan. I'm at last with this instrument. We are pleased at an opportunity to work briefly with this instrument. We are pleased at the opportunity to share this time with each that is here tonight. We would speak on a topic we have spoken on many times in your gatherings, the topic of love, which is essentially intertwined in everything that we bring to share with you. Love for one another, love of a country, for your world, 
and of course an important love you must have for yourself. When we speak of a love for oneself, we wish to express the importance of one appreciating themselves, their essence as being one with the Creator, for if one cannot fully appreciate their true essence, are they not handicapped in their desires to spread the Creator's love to all that is around them? For without that appreciation by which you value the self, can one have the strong faith that in turn accounts for the strong will, which is so important, a driving force in spreading that love you wish to share with those around you? My friends, each of you are indeed the Creator. We have spoken this to you many times before, and yet it seems to be a concept which you hear but do not fully believe. You seem to look at yourself as all too often an insignificant, unable, weak, small factor in the things that go on around you. My friends, the things, the events, the experience that occurs around you is truly your own creation. From the smallest grain of sand on the seaside the multitudes. It is all your creation, certainly not the work of an insignificant entity or another faceless soul, just one among the masses. Recognize, my friends, the gift the Creator has bestowed upon you. Be one with the essence of unlimited abilities the Creator has bestowed upon you. At the same time, the opportunity to limit yourself, each of you are truly treasure, a masterpiece, a consummation of all the greatness of your imaginations and beyond, a difficult concept for you in the confines of this illusion, but all the same, a very real opportunity for each who struggles by themselves. We will transfer this contact. I am Hatton, Carla Channeling. I am Hatton, and greet you once again in love and light, speaking briefly through this instrument only and to use this instrument as vehicle for confirmation both of the direction of our intention and of the subject matter. We are pleased that the confidence of the instruments begins to become set in ways of a realization of service for in truth. As we move about the group with its several channels, the normal courtesy of awaiting a turn and of listening for others should be laid aside so that the tuning may be more and more precise. Then, when the signal comes to you, each channel may pick it up and receive it. Thus, each indeed will take the turn, but the flow of communication will be unfettered and much stronger for this confidence. We would proceed using other channels at this time, and again we ask, as you feel our contact, please feel free to speak, knowing that we speak through only one at a time, and do not, shall we say, put our contact up for grabs, but rather attempt to move from instrument to instrument in such a way that our very simple message may be given the most beautiful and rich interpretation of which we are capable. We would now transfer this contact, I am Hatton, a channeling, I am Hatton. I greet you once again, and we shall speak briefly through this instrument, for that is her desire. To continue on our previous message, we shall add these words, desire to find peace with yourself while you are walking along the path. For when you are at peace, you will be at your center where you can see your own light so that you might bring forth to others more fully. It has been a joy to listen to your animated conversations tonight. However, we would add one bit of warning, which all of you know can't be repeated too often. As has been indicated through the one known as M2, you are all creators. And as you very well know, negative thoughts create just the same as the positive ones. And when you find yourselves dwelling on the negative thoughts of yourself or others, it would be well to remember that you are the creator. Just stopping long enough to remember that we are creators reminds us again of the path we should follow. Indeed, my friends, life can be beautiful. It can be harmonious as you learn how to create your own harmony and beauty. However, we would add one further word. The essence of each of us is harmony and beauty and peace, but your illusion makes it difficult for you to keep this in mind at all times. Again, may we say it has been a pleasure and a joy for us to be with you. And I leave you now in the light and love of the infinite creator. I am Hatton, Carla channeling once again. I am Latouille, 
First our brother Hatan speaks soberly through this instrument about reluctant channels, and then this channel is reluctant. Well, my friends, we still greet you most joyously in the love and the light of the one infinite Creator. How joyful, how wonderful, how lovely it is to be with you. We are so pleased to be able to use this instrument for a word or two before receiving questions. We sense, my friends, that there is a point which wisdom seeks within you this evening. Therefore we are called in a general way, and so we shall share our humble thoughts with you, reminding you that we are but poor fools, and our mummery is but the shabbiest of words covering the nakedness of our ignorance of the ultimate truth. However, what little we know, we share with the utmost pleasure. We are aware, my friends, that each of you has desired to know what it is that you shall do in response to your great and precious knowledge. How shall you be the givers of yourselves? How shall you share? Well, my friends, if we are speaking of your money, we could simply say, give such and such an amount, give such and such a percentage, for in your world, it is not easy to think in terms of quantity, and in your life, do you not often judge yourself by the quantity of your actions? Let us examine, my friends. What is it that you have to share? It is written in your holy works, that that which you have is like a tiny bit of yeast, which put in a large amount of grain leavened the whole. It was not a great quantity that the one known as Jesus discussed in his teaching. It was a very small amount, but it was a very small amount of the proper quality. What you have to share is a quality, not a quantity. Those who love want to do much, but they must first understand the work of love is infinite. You cannot do a great deal of infinite work or a small amount of infinite work, you do infinite work. Now my friends, to business then, how do you do infinite work for a certain quality? You are not all alike. This our brothers and sisters of Hatan have spoken of. Each has a totally unique radiance, and that is the quality that you have to give. You do not all have equal gifts, yet each gift is most blessed, and that gift, whatever it may be, is the quality that you have to give. Therefore, my friends, before you share the leaven of hope, of praise, of joy, of faith, of light, of love, allow that second of silent opening within, that prayer which is so simple, my friends, not my will, but my will, O Creator, the will of me as you be done, not the little self, but the great self, open me, use me, this is the prayer, this is the hope, this is the faith. It only takes a fraction of a second, my friends, and in that fraction of a second, you may well exchange quantity for quality. Your people hurry and scurry. Our brother Hatan points us to the clouds of your planet. What quality of radiance awaits you in the center of your effortless perfect being? And under what bushel of busyness and quantity do you hide that radiance? Much has been given you, my brothers and sisters. You are very close to the kingdom you desire. All that is precious lies just beyond the illusion of the door. Meditation is a key, prayer another. Now, may you rejoice and shine forth your light in a dark world that all who come unto you may feel the healing. But let it not be effortful or burdensome or difficult. Let it be that which is done so that no one shall know. Let your light shine so that the kingdom is revealed, not you. Perhaps the most difficult thing for a pilgrim to do is to discover how to get out of the way of that great and abiding flame of love. Let it burn through you, never from you. We shall now put you atop the clouds of our brothers and sisters of Hatan and let you float merrily there, thinking your thoughts and perhaps asking a few questions, if you would. To this end, we thank this instrument, reluctant though she was, and would at this time transfer to one who does us great service for which we are forever grateful. I am Latouille, Jim Channeling. I am Latouille and greet you once again in love and light. We are now honored to offer our humble selves in the capacity of attempting response to your queries 
May we ask then if there might be a query? I have one, Latouille. What is the principle behind identical twins or identical triplets? I am Latouille, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. In the case of the births of entities of what you call the identical nature, there is the incarnation of entities of the exact vibrational frequency which have chosen to play out certain patterns of interrelationships which have developed over great periods of what you call time and through many of what you call the incarnations. Such entities have experienced a great portion of their existence in a shared manner so that it becomes appropriate at a certain time, so to speak, to make that shared experience complete. In such a situation, it is then determined that what is called the birth of twins, triplets, and so forth of an identical nature might be appropriate and is then undertaken. The underlying reason for this, to summarize, is the completion of a pattern of existence which has been chosen by free will, by entities, which have found a mutual comradeship and learning possible in an intensified manner within other or others, and this journey is then manifested in such and such a manner. May we answer you further, my sister. Thank you. I do have another question. What causes people to go to excesses, whether it's overeating, drinking, or drugs, or overworking, or any other form of excess? I am Latouille. And I'm aware of your query, my sister. To reply most accurately to such a query, we find that our response may seem much too simplistic. But it might be said that any entity which exhibits the great distortion in any direction is either attempting to balance the opposite bias, or is attempting to develop a certain bias, which then may itself be balanced. This is the plan of the Creator for the gathering of experience. It might also be suggested that for some entities, there is the momentary difficulty in developing the desired bias, and what might be called an overreaction to the halting of progress might then also be developed as a bias, which was not the primary intention. Nevertheless, each bias provides the opportunity for balance, and each balance the opportunity for experience. May we answer you further, my sister? I'm not exactly sure. Do you mean that they deliberately go in a certain direction, or that their personality is out of sync, at that particular time, and they are not entirely aware of what they're doing? I am Latouille, and to clarify our previous response, may we suggest that before the incarnation, certain lessons which might be called biases are determined appropriate for that incarnation. These biases may appear during the incarnation to be in excess. There might be also the free will choice of the entity during the incarnation, unaware of the pre-incarnative choice to respond to the developing bias in yet another overblown fashion, shall we say. Each action, whether determined before the incarnation or during the incarnation, provides a bias, whether great or small, which then must needs be balanced by its opposite bias. Such balancing then aids in the gathering of experience, and this experience is the reason for the incarnation itself. May we answer you further, my sister? No, I think you've answered it. But it seems like I have a lot of questions. I got a third one. When test two babies are formed, does that interfere with the normal progression? I am Latouille, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. Within the bounds of your illusion, such would seem the case. For the great majority of entities which enter your illusion do so in a manner which is quite unlike that you have described, and would seem to be quite homogenous. In some respects, of course, this is quite correct. But we might also note that each entity's entrance into the illusion which you now inhabit is quite unique. Some who enter your illusion do not actually inhabit the physical vehicle of the fetus for some period of what you call time, choosing to enter at the last moment, shall we say, when birth has occurred. And some, even after that event, as well. If an entity should therefore decide to enter your illusion, a method for its entering shall be made available. This method might include what has recently been developed by your scientists, that being the test tube entrance. This does provide a certain framework within which the new entity then begins the incarnation. That it is different from most others is undeniably correct. That most others are homogenous is not correct, for all are quite unique. Each entity is provided the precise requirements to proceed with the incarnation before it. May we answer you further, my sister? No, I think you've answered the question, but it's brought up a fourth one. When babies are aborted, are they usually inhabited by an entity, or are the babies which no entity has inhabited? I am Latouille. To speak again to the heart of this query, we must again note, there cannot be a general statement which is adequate. Some entities need only the briefest of experiences of a certain nature within your illusion, 
and are with the vehicle which has been, as you have described, aborted. A larger majority, shall we say, of these aborted physical vehicles are not inhabited, for it is known that they shall not reach your illusions, shall we say. May we answer you further, my sister? No, that's fine. You've given me a lot of good answers. I am Latweeth. We thank you, my sister, for your excellent queries. May we ask if there might be another query at this time? I'd like to follow up on that last question just a little bit. Are you saying, then, that although a fetus is beginning to grow, it is not really alive with the soul yet in some cases? I am Latweeth, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. This is not a simple query with which a response can easily be matched. In one sense, the entire creation is alive and sings with the spirit of the one creator. There is no portion that does not have this spirit. And it is also true in another sense that when an entity known as a fetus is housed within its mother's womb, there is often the absence of the enlivening mind-body-spirit complex, which is common among your peoples, and without which the fetus would not appear to be human, as you call it but without which, in rare instances, the physical vehicle of the orange ray may yet function. In some cases, this fetus does indeed contain the mind-body-spirit complex, which gives its coloration of humanity as you call it, for it has been determined by the incarnating entity that an early, as you might call it, entrance into this fetus is useful for the beginning of the lessons of this incarnation. May we answer you further, my sister? Is a child ever born without that whole complex, and receives it afterwards. I am Latwee. This is correct, my sister. May we answer you further? No, thank you. That's fine. I am Latwee. We thank you. Is there another question at this time? Carla, are there ever borderline cases where a mother and a child may have an agreement before the incarnation of both to have a life together, and then the mother finds herself in a position where the public ethic is not useful to her, and the private ethic is basically unknown, and so she wavers a great deal and finally ends up aborting, so that the fetus is occupied, and then, when it is observed that birth is not going to be possible, the mind-body-spirit complex simply leaves and awaits another opportunity? Is that ever possible, so that it's sort of a yes and no sometimes, instead of just sometimes yes and sometimes no? I am Latouille and am aware of your query, my sister. You have correctly surmised that before each incarnation agreements are made. The agreements made, shall we say, are not ironclad. There are in many cases contingency plans, as you might call them, which recognize the ever-changing nature of what you call your future as free will exerts its force within your illusion. If certain boundaries or parameters of the incarnation in its beginning are met, then it is begun as planned. If there is a significant change in such boundaries, then there might be the decision to take an alternative route for entry into the illusion and an alternative means of joining the relationship with the one already within the illusion. Though this is somewhat unusual, it is ever possible. May we answer you further, my sister? Carla. Yes, I'm very interested in this subject, along with almost everybody. I suppose I have an instinctive feeling about whether abortion is right or not. The debate runs high on that one, and discarding the concept of sin, I would take up the concept of karma. Is it ever possible that by aborting a child with whom one has made a very careful agreement, one may, a mother, may collect the karma, which is simply the promise for future, so it's missed this time? but there will be another lifetime in which that relationship will be worked out? Is it ever that inevitable, or is it freer than that? I am Latwee, and I am aware of your query, my sister. To speak of that known as karma is to use a term which has among many of your peoples an emotional impact which we do not desire to invoke. We would, however, suggest that entities which engage in an agreement which is then altered by the activity known as abortion will at some point within the incarnation or another complete that agreement which has been made. The ability of entities upon your planet to utilize what you have called abortion adds yet another variable to entities which are deciding upon the means of relating one to another and of beginning the incarnation. Within your illusion are an infinite variety of such considerations which must be taken into account by each entity before the incarnation. Thus, the addition of one or more variables does have its effect, and this effect may or may not be profound. It is, however, considered by each entity before the incarnation is begun, and does, as does each consideration, have certain repercussions, which then must be balanced. May we answer you further, my sister? Carla, only to confirm that this would be the answer which you would also give to questions about voluntary birth control and voluntary sterilization. I am Latwee. My sister, that is quite correct. As would such items within your illusion as the transportation by your various vehicles, 
and their likelihood of collision and subsequently passing from the incarnation, as would the various chemicals and drugs utilized by those of whom you call healers, as would the great variety of means of interacting which your game sports provide, as indeed would each activity which is available within your illusion provide the need for an entity entering your illusion to consider its impact upon the incarnation. May we answer you further, my sister? Yes, because at last, although General didn't get to what I wanted to find out, there are many more women, I think, that are simply very careful not to have children for one reason or another than have abortions. My question was whether there was a possibility that the same karma, to use a non-emotional form of this word, might be caused by being voluntarily sterilized or using voluntary birth control when a woman had forgotten that she had agreed before incarnation to be in a mother and child relationship with another entity who is then unable to enter. What I'm trying to do is to get to the heart of all of the nonsense that has been spoken about on both sides about not just abortion but birth control. So I'd like to find out if there's an actual amount of, shall we say, delay or damage that one can do by birth control or sterilization to an entity with whom you had the agreement or whether birth control is simply something that person does because the person is inwardly aware that no such agreements have been made for this period or at all. Can you get anything out of that question? I am Latwi and indeed my sister. We believe we feel the heart of your query has been well expressed. We would once again respond by suggesting that there are no mistakes within your illusion. When an entity chooses to enter within your third density illusion, it is well aware of the parameters within which it shall move, of the resources which to it shall be available. The agreements made before the incarnation are agreements made in the light of this knowledge. Therefore, there is in truth no action which can be undertaken by any during the incarnation which were not seen as possibilities before the incarnation began. Thus, each activity which is engaged in during the illusion does have its effect Yet each activity was also known to be a possibility before the incarnation was begun. Therefore, such actions are not undertaken in a willy-nilly fashion, shall we say. Though their effects shall be felt by those in their vicinity, these effects have also been chosen. May we answer you further, my sister? Carla, so there isn't the case where the child is waiting, hoping to be born to a certain mother, and then it comes as a big surprise because sterilization has occurred or birth control is consistently used, you're saying that to a certain extent this enough is known about the incarnations of both that this situation just doesn't occur? I am Latwi, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. This, in general, is quite correct. Though, it is also a possibility that an entity awaiting the incarnation shall await that incarnation somewhat longer than originally intended. This is also a possibility which is seen by each entity which attempts to enter that illusion which you now inhabit. The great range of sight, shall we say, or the far-seeing ability which is denied to those within your illusion is that factor which resolves the great complex difficulty which an entity has in attempting to clarify just how this illusion operates. Before the incarnation, the range of sight is quite without time or space, and an entity might view into what you call the future with a great degree of clarity, and therefore make the necessary choices for the upcoming, as you would say, incarnation. May we answer you further, my sister. I'd like to ask one more short question. I think I've dragged this line of questioning out long enough. Is it possible that a person could have to reincarnate instead of graduating in order to complete an agreement? In other words, stay in third density instead of going on with graduation because of a missed agreement. I am Latwi and I'm aware of your query, my sister. As we have said, Many times all things are quite possible, though most activities are very difficult to generalize and predict with certainty. All things are indeed quite possible. May we answer you further, my sister? No, thank you, Latwi. I am Latwi. We thank you. May we ask if there might be another question at this time? Yes. Regarding the free will of the woman who chooses to abort or not to have children, is the woman exercising the same free will that she exercises when she decides to marry or not to marry or when she decides to work or not to work? Is it a matter of exercising the free will? What I'm trying to say, she's exercising her free will in each instance in whether to abort or whether not to abort. And is there any difference in the degrees of exercising her free will? I am Latwi, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. 
Each choice, no matter what the subject, is an exercise of will freely made. As the mind is configured by its very nature of being, and as it gathers the experiences of your illusion, it becomes biased, either in the service to self-sense or in the service to other sense. With this general coloration, then, does the individual entity begin to increase its polarization so that each choice which is made adds in some fashion to that polarization. Each choice, no matter what the subject of the choice, then might be seen as adding or subtracting from the polarization which is the general character, shall we say, of the entity. The various choices available within the illusion are simply means by which an entity adds to the polarization which it has chosen. May we answer you further, my sister? No, I think that answers the question. Just one other brief question. The planet is rapidly becoming overpopulated. And I think in the last session, I remember that you said that people were entities were choosing to come here at this point in time, as we call time, in order to go through the harvest. Now, my question is, if I got that much of it right, my question is, are entities coming here choosing to live in poverty? Because many of them are living in poverty. Are they literally choosing to live in poverty until the time of the harvest? I am Latouille, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. Indeed, you have stated the situation quite correctly. It is a paradox within your illusion to consider these elements of your illusion, such as poverty, hunger, disease, pain, warfare, delicacies, yet such existences provide an entity with the greatest of opportunities in which to learn love in the shortest of what you call periods of time. Therefore, as your cycle grows to an end, you will see the varieties of experience increase in all fashions, including those which within your illusion are normally seen as quite undesirable. Yet within the greater framework of the progression through the densities, such characteristics offer great opportunities for evolution of mind and body and spirit. May we answer you further, my sister. So then, some may have come here at this point just to get blown up with an atomic bomb? Is that stretching it a little too far? I am Latouille, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. It is somewhat, shall we say, the case that entities would seek the traumatic experience up to a certain point. For beyond that point, which you have described, there is seen the trauma to the mind-body-spirit complex which tends to break apart that complex and reduce its ability to assimilate experience and therefore require a great period of what you would call time to be undergone in the healing and reintegration of those complexes. Therefore, it is the desire of entities entering your illusion at this time to experience as intensely as possible the opportunities for learning the lessons of love without damaging the complexes which enable the learning to continue. May we answer you further, my sister? Oh, that makes sense. Thank you very much. I am Latouille. We thank you very much as well. Is there another query at this time? Carla. Yes. I have one more because I'm sort of riveted on this point here. I always thought when I was a young woman that I was destined to have children, about six of them, as a matter of fact. And I never had children. The one child I ever conceived I lost spontaneously and I'm now sterilized voluntarily. Reluctantly, but voluntarily. And I've spent much time actually thinking about what children wanted me for their mother. And although I realized that it was completely necessary within the way I look at things now that I not have children so that I can do the work that we're doing, I think about those children and I wonder how they're doing. And if I have in some way incurred some karma because of the forgotten agreements that I made possibly with them. I feel sure that this is true of other women as well. Is there some way to communicate with these souls in such a way to ask their forgiveness and so stop the wheel of karma? I am Latouille, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. To begin, may we suggest that you presume much that is not necessarily as you presumed it to be. It is the case with most entities entering your illusion that parallel, if we may call them, programs of incarnation are seen as possibilities. If one choice is not taken, then another presents itself so that those lessons be learned are available. It is quite difficult to describe to entities within your illusion the freedom and fluidity with which these choices are made and pursued. Within your illusion, it is generally the case that a plan is made and undertaken, and then if an alteration is made, the changes in the outcome are easily attributable. However, before the incarnation, the range and freedom of choice is such that level upon level agreement is made, therefore allowing for changes to occur. For though there is the ability to see into what is called your future, this ability also sees 
that nothing can be known for sure, that there shall be changes, that therefore there needs to be plans for the changes. If one event occurs, then this allows another, but may disallow yet another, and so forth in an endless progression of cause and effect. Therefore there cannot truly be said to be mistakes within any incarnation, for each has been perfect. We move briefly to a portion of a channeling from February 21st, 1985. I am Hatan, and I greet you in the love and light of our infinite creator. We thank you for following us to speak with you this evening. And we use this time to tell a story and to test a point or two that may aid you in thinking at this time. Once there was a man who wished to build a fence of bricks. This man was a proud man, and he wished his wall to be perfect. It was with exquisite care that he laid the plumb line and found the perfect horizontal level. The man was happy as he took fastidious care to begin his task rightly. The sun shone down upon him until he was very warm, yet he welcomed the sun. Indeed, the entity welcomed the chance to do the work that was necessary in order to begin to build his wall. The entity of whom we spoke welcomed the labors necessary for the construction of his wall, for he welcomed the opportunity to place his efforts in attunement with the pace of the universe. He was able to sense in operations surrounding him for just as the plumb line was true and the level a perfect one, so also did the universe about him operate with perfection. And as the subject of our tale perceived this state and moved in harmony within it, he felt the joy one feels when one becomes aware of the godness within one's own efforts. The act of creation and progress constantly about the entity was reflected in his own effort to create this wall. And as his efforts were directed truly and accurately toward the completion of this perfect wall, so also did his contentment grow in his sense of fulfillment in the manifestation of that force he could feel about himself. Upon its completion, another entity spoke to him in regards to his efforts questioning the value of a wall, an object often used to shut other selves out. His contentment remained undisturbed. His reply was that the perfection lay within the object he had created, and that it would remain perfect regardless of the efforts another might make to corrupt that perfection through misuse. My friends, we often perceive about us our brothers and sisters engaged in actions which we may not understand or may preconceive a value for, and it is difficult to avoid attributing our pre-developed prejudices to individuals or the works they originate, which remind us of what has occurred or what we have perceived within our own past experiences. My brothers and my sister, a wall is but a wall. An act of creation is simply an act of creation, which may be used as a tool towards selflessness or selfishness. And it is not always easy to perceive the intention which was in the mind of its creator. Be cautious, my friends, that you might avoid misunderstanding the efforts of another through your perceptions of similar efforts on the parts of those who have gone before. For it is within the heart of the builder, not the hands, that the potential value may grow. Relationships with others might be likened to walls, but even more we draw the simile, the wall to speak about yourselves. An attempt to come into right relationship with another is an attempt to cross walls on many levels of this meaning. The first wall which must be true is the structure of your own being. Perhaps your basic character is excellent, the lines true and straight, yet they have become dilapidated bricks or stones, missing mortar, failing. Therefore, when one is contemplating the experiences which arise within a relationship, it is well to begin the contemplation with an objective gaze inwardly, directly at the structure of the self. If the base is not perfectly horizontal, if it is not quite plumb, then all will seem out of tune, out of order, shaky and fraught with difficulty. Therefore, we suggest that you use meditation and contemplation to build yourself as inspiration, gives you one piece of knowledge and then another, and another as you move along the pathway of discovery. When you gaze beyond your own wall of being, beyond your own structure at another, it is well to remember that there is only one builder for each building that exists. That builder is the being itself. Each entity is created uniquely, first male or female, then an incredible variety of other polarities. All these pieces of structure are placed together to build the skeletal being through which consciousness is manifested. How shall two walls which are fixed relate to each other? My friends, it is time to release the allegory and gaze at an illusion which may illuminate the denser illusion in which you now enjoy existence. The walls that you build within yourself are energy fields. 
Therefore, they are movable and must move with you wherever you go. The stance which you take, the wall which you choose to use, behind which you choose to hide within a relationship with another, is that which must be observed, analyzed, and balanced in such a way that the wall again becomes an energy field, which is permeable. I am Latui, and am once again with this instrument. May we attempt another query at this time? One more, and then we'll quit. I understand that anger often produces cancer in people. I was contemplating what brings about the heart trouble. If it can be associated with certain emotions, is it as simple as heartbreak or sorrow? I am Latui, and am aware of your query, my sister. Though generalities are often frequently our lot in attempting to answer your queries, they are quite often not specifically accurate in all instances for there are anomalies in all general rules. As you look to the disease that any entity may be experiencing, one may look to the nature of the disease, the effect of the disease upon the entity. Frequently, it is also possible to look to the location of the difficulty within an entity and be able to place this difficulty within its corresponding energy center, then discovering the nature of the energy blockage according to the energy center involved. In the case of difficulties with the heart, one of the two primary organs within the human being as you know it, one deals with a portion of the physical vehicle which has analogous and extensive relationships with each of the various energy centers. For this organ does by its functioning provide the entire physical vehicle with the nutrients that are carried by the bloodstream, as it is called. This organ then is that which in the physical sense enlivens the entire physical vehicle and circulates the essence of that vehicle throughout its system of transport, shall we say. An entity who feels the difficulty or disease which is located within the heart is an entity who in many cases has blocked the ability of the finer body or energy center's heart in its actions of providing life-sustaining and life-enhancing energy or essence not only to the self but perhaps to other selves as well. As you look upon the energy center which has the closest correlation to the physical organ of the heart, the green ray energy center then is brought into focus in its functioning of providing the unconditional love and support that is the building block, shall we say, or life-sustaining force throughout all creation. When a portion of this force has been activated within an entity and then upon a subsequent occasion been blocked in some degree, there may be an expression of this blockage with the physical organ of the heart. The variety of kinds of blockages is so great as to be quite beyond our ability to enumerate with any hope of completion, we can suggest that as we have mentioned, the function of the physical heart in providing the entire vehicle sustenance is analogous to the green ray energy center and it's providing the unconditional love and creative force which underlies all of creation. May we attempt a further response, my sister? No, thank you. I am Latui and we thank you, my sister. We must apologize for our response, which is quite lengthy and yet was not able to be as specific as you had hoped. Carlos says, well, since you've said that, I'll tell you the reason I hesitated. It was not because I didn't think you were very clear. I did. I realized that you have to take all generalizations with a good deal of grains of salt. I was going to go into somewhat baroque question of the mechanical things that people will tell you will hurt the heart, the cholesterol, the plaque and smoking, various things like that. I decided not to because I realized I thought about it. Actually, those behaviors, the ways of eating, the ones that feel about one's body is probably tied in, just as you said, with a grain of salt, with the feeling one has about oneself as a person who offers love. So I didn't ask the question, but I thought that you were very specific, as specific as you could be. Thank you. I'm Latui, and we thank you, my sister. We can make the additional general comment that when an entity is engaging in those patterns of thought which tend to block any of the various energy centers, whatever means is available to that entity, that will allow the expression of that blockage when it has not been noticed by the mental process of analysis will then be utilized. Those which are of the scientist's career have noted the similarity of certain of your cultural habits and customs which are closely related to certain dysfunctions. Yet, many cases, these are not available to an individual, and yet other means must be profound to produce symbolic disease of the physical vehicle, in order that the mental complex might then take note and more efficiently use that catalyst which was not well used when first presented to the entity. May we answer your query further? Thank you. I am Latui, and we find that we have for the moment exhausted those queries which have so graciously been placed before us this evening. We thank you each of my friends for your graciousness 
and once again extending to us the invitation to join your seeking of the truth this evening. We as humble messengers and pilgrims upon that one and same path are gratified to be able to join you and remind each of you that it is only because we have traveled a bit further upon that path that we attempt to aid you upon your journey. We have no hard, shall we say, and fast rules which must be obeyed or ever listened to. Take that then which has the value to you for your own consideration. Leave that then which has no value in your considerations. We shall leave this group at this time and return upon your request. In the love and the light, then we leave you and thank you and bless you. We are those of Latwi, Aronai, Aronai, my friend. And that concludes these two channelings that were given in the 80s. At the very beginnings of the Quo channelings, I found them interesting, instructional, and very enlightening about a variety of different ideas. There are some thought-provoking stories, and you can sort of see a subtle difference when Hatan is channeling as opposed to Latwi. And oftentimes you can see that when you're reading a quote channeling, you can see which of the entities has a greater influence in that channeling. I would love to know how it works. Like, do they have a place somewhere in the universe where they teleport and they talk together? Do they share notes? Do they email with each other? Are they knowing of these questions way ahead of time? Because they've implied that. I'd love to know how they actually integrate into the quote entity. There's some startling questions about abortion and birth and reincarnation and what we do prior to incarnation and how that affects our karma. I've heard this before. It is an interesting Indian belief that you are actually not in the body. The mind body spirit complex is not in the body or the soul is not in the body until it laughs until it first laughs. And so it may be three or four months until that soul enters into the body. And we may very well have some agreements, but as is implied, everything is working out perfectly. And there are a variety of different alternatives. And it would appear when we're accessing the higher self, we are aware of all the different realities. And we're pretty likely going to have certain things pop up. We're going to have a child with that person, a relationship with that person, a job with that person. Even though it may happen in different ways, we will encounter different people in our lives as we plan out to resolve and undergo lessons in love. It's always been that way. That's how they've always explained it. And it's very educational, instructional. You can see the place on Carla's spiritual path because she's worried about kids she never had. And if she's paying karmic consequences for that, she was dedicated and focused to harvesting and graduating into that fourth density. And we have had confirmation of that in recent channelings that she is joining with Quo in the channelings and offers her motherly energy for people if they decide to share in meditation. Please share your impressions of this channeling and if this helped you in understanding Quo as it did me. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. I'd love it if you checked out my art. We have now listed 300 new original pieces. There are some amazing sigils available there. And you can find that at www.newearth.art. And welcome to the Reality Revolution. <laughs>